You're listening to Got Tech, the podcast with your hosts, Eric Geis and Nick Johnson. Welcome back to Got Tech, the podcast. This is episode 87 called STEM and Conservation Efforts with Helen Corvaline. In this episode, we'll sit down with STEM and ed tech expert Helen Corvaline. We talk about all things STEM, including STEM misconceptions, some best STEM practices, some favorite STEM projects, and tons of STEM resources for teachers. This is another episode you don't want to miss. Check it out. So we're wrapping up the school year with episode 87, for the most part. We might throw in an additional one there at the end and uh, head into summer. I could tell that this episode is about STEM since you said it 60 times in the opening, and I'm very excited about this one because not only is it about STEM, something I'm very passionate about, but it's also with a very special guest. And really, I'm just in a room of royalty here today because both our guest and Nick have won some special awards. You were both our school teacher of the year for our district, uh, and you were also Mercer County Teachers of the Year. So with that, Nick, why don't you give it a go? Yeah, that's a that's a great segue to do the official introduction to a very special guest today. She is a K-5 STEM facilitator, Governor's Educator of the Year, Mercer County Teacher of the Year, adjunct professor at the College of New Jersey and Miami University in Ohio, as well as director of the Hopewell Elementary School Gardens, welcome to the show, Helen Corvaline. <laughs> Helen, how are you doing today? Wow, guys, that was quite the setup. I mean, I really, uh, I should hang out with you guys more often. Yeah, I know, it's funny. And I always, for a long time, I was super uncomfortable about people bringing up the educator of the year yep, stuff yep. because. If you're like me, I never felt like I did anything extra special. Beyond or, your job. Yeah, beyond what the job is. So the recognition is nice, but it always feels a little bit weird to have it like touted as some It giant does, thing. especially when you're introduced as royalty. So, you right. know. Well, I mean, my thanks me, to you there. me myself, I, <laughs> I, I got to catch up a little bit. I, I'm, I'm a slacker in this room. That's what nah, I feel I don't like. think you're a slacker. But I, I will I tell you, you I did enjoy uh, seeing everyone's picture posted by the main office every time I walked into Hopewell Elementary and every time I walked into our high school, I get to see Nick's uh, beautiful face there and I got to use a whiteboard marker and draw faces over it <laughs> yeah, all exactly. year long. That's the worst part. Did they do that in your school to put you your know, picture up? You know, there's not as much face, you know, defacing at our at our school. So, you know, we keep the uh, the expo markers on lockdown oh, down at HES. Lucky. I wish that was the case here. But that's, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, now, you know, we are actually super excited because if you're a listener to Got Tech, you know that both guys and I are science teachers, or for guys, uh, used to be a science teacher, although this year obviously did get back into the classroom. And, you know, we, we every once in a while on the show dip into some content-specific stuff, and today that's what we're kind of doing with, uh, with Helen. So obviously, if you couldn't tell from the 50 times that I said it in the intro, we're talking STEM today, and if there is a STEM expert to have on the show, Helen Corvaline is that expert. So I'm going to just jump straight into some some questions for you so our listeners can sort of get to know you and hopefully learn some stuff about STEM and some ways to do it. So I know one of our favorite things that we like to do is to just kind of learn about your journey in education. So if you could start with that, tell us a little bit about when you wanted to be a teacher and sort of how you got to where you are today. Awesome. Well, thanks for the great intro. I don't know if I'm the expert on all things STEM, but um, I definitely enjoy it. So I'm definitely STEM enthusiast. I uh, came to teaching um, kind of... In a disgruntled fashion, actually, I was not. Uh, I was not starting off to be a STEM teacher. I was. I was really looking to go into environmental uh, policy, and you know, political climates as they are, you never know if you're going to have a job if you want to work for the right kind of people, which for me was the earth. And so I decided um, that I would follow my mother's advice, who really, everybody out there listening, um, you should always listen to your mother's advice. <laughs> and she said, Helen, you have 
have to be a teacher. You've got it. It's in you. And I was like, nah, mom, okay. I'm, I'm good. I'm not doing that. So then I did my student teacher and was like, oh, shoot, she was right. My mother <laughs> again. Instead of wrestling environmental policy with adults, I decided to change young learners' minds and um, really raise them as environmentalists. And so I came to STEM in kind of the outdoor nature conservation way, but see conservation in every aspect of STEM. So it's kind of a little bit of a more for me in that way. That's pretty cool. We've done some, uh, one of the things that brought Geis and I to maybe in a roundabout way doing this show do you remember the geocaching presentation mm-hmm. we did years ago? Yeah, we did several of them. Yeah. But I remember it being at the science convention. Right. And we actually got there early in the morning, mm-hmm. and we hit geocaches all over the campus. Oh, how fun. And uh, little did we kn- I mean, we used ammo cans. I, I'm sure, looking back, we could have probably used <laughs> a better container right. for yeah. that. But <laughs> we were definitely uh, probably looked at a time or two and we're hiding stuff in the bushes yeah but it was super fun and it kind of was in that realm of conservation and we even had the your your uh, bioethics field trip to a local park kind of focused on recycling and just taking care of your local park so it's kind of cool almost yeah. we all have like in a roundabout way have this yeah the merge of those you know those kind of kind of areas because you need that as far as you know planetary stewardship and um and if we're going to do that through STEM, more creativity and, and innovation, the better. Yeah, for sure. So that's uh, a nice commonality. And maybe that's a good time to get into STEM. So, you know, I would assume everybody knows what it is, but but maybe not. We may have some teachers joining us from all different walks. So do you want to start off and kind of explain to people, maybe even just in your mind, what STEM is and what role it plays in a classroom today. Sure. So um, STEM is known affectionately as science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. There are many of us who feel comfortable or feel a calling in more than one of those fields. I think um, engineering has been a surprise for me as not being taught as a young learner um, within the field of engineering. I think had I been exposed the way our kids are exposed now um, to engineering, I really would have consider that as a career. And so, you know, science was kind of always my passion and outdoor science was my passion. So I always like to uh, walk by classrooms where people were learning intensely within walls and be have my hiking boots strapped on and gear in my hands and ready to explore wetlands and kind of giggle and say, <laughs> see ya. <laughs> and, you know, truck off to forests and streams and um, feel like I was playing but really doing science so science the science part was really my calling and then I came um, to teach STEM and was fascinated by you know creating those opportunities for kids to be creative and use design thinking um, within the engineering mindset and then I think engineering kind of holds technology's hand and brings it along um, in order to implement scientific scientific principles and then really you know the mathematics is the language that we're using in order to communicate communicate, convince, and really kind of, um, we don't like to say prove in science. So really kind of encourage and support with data and research. I, I guess one of the biggest things that I, I find with STEM is that there are a lot of different definitions. Mm-hmm. And I often hear individual subject teachers, such as a math teacher or a science teacher say, hey, I'm STEM because I teach math. Mm -hmm. Or I'm STEM because I teach science. How does that, like, what would you, uh, is there anything there that we need to clear up a little bit as far as do we need all four subjects in order to be STEM? I mean, I know I have my own personal thoughts, but I'm Mm -hmm. interested to hear what you have to say. So this is a, this actually could go into the hot seat questions. Um, (laughs) And uh, because this is a bit of a hot seat, I think. I think that people, you know, have really strong opinions on this. I sure do. And I think that you are a STEM teacher when you integrate the other disciplines within your own. And so looking at, you know, not just looking in a tunnel at 
mathematics of really seeing where the application is. I had an astronomer in the other day, um, actually a mathematician, and it's funny that I just referred to him as an astronomer because um, he ta his hobby is to take um, astro photos through his telescope. But in order to figure out where he wants to be and what planetary alignment he wants to get in his pictures, he uses math to figure that out. To me, that is STEM. Mm -hmm. And so it's when you're really using all of the disciplines together and not just claiming yourself as one or the other. So I feel like that claim is kind of where we can, um, you know, what we identify as. If you identify as STEM, you're claiming all of those for your own. And you're claiming and proclaiming all of those four areas and, and acknowledging how they work in tandem. And that unison is really what we look for in innovators. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, everything that you said, but I also like to tie in what you said earlier with design thinking. Yep. In and there. that's why I don't go with STEAM. Yeah. I am a STEM girl through and through. There's, I think A is inherent. I think art, creative thinking, design thinking, all of that is inherent in being a good STEM practitioner. That's a that's an excellent point that yeah. I necessarily didn't think of. But when when I think of STEM, I think of harmony amongst all of it, and I think. What you said What's your bio background i know <laughs> i like to think of harmonious things mm -hmm. and uh that that's my my biggest uh draw to stem is that you don't necessarily have to be a great student in all four of these or a great teacher in all four of these you just have to be willing to give them a shot and to embrace the uncomfortable sometimes and that yeah. to me is going to make you more well-rounded yes. as a person yes and as a as a thought partner for someone else too that that's a great point if uh you're very good at the the s and the t and i'm good at the e and the m we make a perfect pair and that's harmonious wow that was deep oh. <laughs> poetry it's i mean these are all awesome points and i'm glad you brought it up because you know i teach ap chemistry i'm not a stem teacher i, I would never say it because i don't do anything with engineering because that AP exam for better or worse is what I'm prepping kids for and engineering's not a part of it. We like maybe graze the very surface by doing like experimental design, mm -hmm. but that's not close to what engineering is supposed to be. So I think that's an important part of almost the definition of STEM is you got to actually incorporate all those things to, you do. to be that. You do. And I think what you can what you can maybe identify with there, Mr. Johnson, is that you can you are preparing the kids for a STEM career if they choose that, because you're giving them the foundational principles that they need in order to be problem solvers. Right. That's a big distinction. And I think this kind of, you know, brings up a, a whole other uh, can of worms in a discussion that we'll, we'll touch on as we go forward here. Yeah. Sometimes when you go to define something, it's also good to say what it is not mm -hmm. right so let's bring up some myths what do you say yeah i mean we found several of these things and we wanted to kind of run some by you helen to kind of see what you thought about them um misconceptions myths whatever you want to call them some commonly held beliefs perhaps which kind of is what we've been doing so far already so the first one here uh is that it's only important for those who want to become scientists what do you think about that one well, just because the S is the leader in STEM doesn't mean that science is STEM. And so I think when people say, you know, oh, my kid is STEMI or my student is a STEMI kid because they're good at science, I think you're, you're missing the boat on right. that. And I think that what you really need to embrace is how does your student or your child tackle problems. How do they look at and approach problem solving in mathematics, in tech, in video game playing, in whatever they're interested in? And are you nurturing that ability to navigate the problem? And are they using are they using science skills? Sure. Are they using engineering and, you know, revision skills within that problem solving? Yeah. So um, really, STEM is important for everybody. Like there shouldn't be anybody who's not exposed to it. So um, I think to say it's only for kids that want to become scientists, you know, 
kids that want to become artists should have a deep understanding of STEM because let me tell you, their art is going to be exponentially better with a STEM background. Everything will. I like that even just for, you know, I would say for science in general is not just for future science students or scientists mm -hmm. because like science is literally just really problem solving and mm -hmm. thinking about what's the what's at work here what is the issue and then testing different things to see what can solve it so to say that you know you don't like science or you don't need it or you don't even maybe some people might say they don't believe in science i don't even really understand that comment because if your car breaks down you start doing science to figure out what might be wrong with mm -hmm. it by thinking of some things that might be wrong, fixing them one at a time and seeing what works. That's science. And, and you could extend that then to STEM thinking too. Sure. These are just skills for like life and being successful in whatever you do. You hit a home run or dingers as they like to say out there in the <laughs> field. Man, oh man, you got to figure out how that, how to make that happen again. And happen so again. all of a sudden your application, yep. you know, is right there. So, so the other day I was actually at baseball practice mm -hmm. and uh, the kid, I coach a team and the kid came in a little late and the mother came up and apologized. And I was like, what are you apologizing for? Well, he's late. And I was like, okay. And she goes, oh, he's a very STEMI kid. And <laughs> he apparently does this uh, course. It's an enrichment course. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a STEM course. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. He's a problem solver. And she goes, no, he's STEMI. And I was like, <laughs> we're, good. Yeah. We're, we're, we're good there. But I've never heard STEMI except for now with you and with this mom. Oh, so I, yeah. I thought that uh, Oh, yeah. That we'll catch up on the vernacular sure. right. in the mom world. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This next one, I mean, uh, this is an obvious one, but STEM is for males. What, oh. do, you, <laughs> what do we think oh. about that? I can't believe you just said that, Nick. I feel bad saying it, but it's under our myths, myths category, and misconceptions. So. Yeah, but yeah. I still feel like I might have to hold her back a little bit. I saw you do. That, you I do have that, to. I saw that vein in I'll the forehead. I'll step That's out right. Of the room for That's a right. Um, so STEM is most definitely not for males. In fact, some may argue that females really are the problem solvers and the future. However, with you lovely gentlemen here, I'm not going to make that argument too loud. So really. <laughs> Um, when we look at the STEM pipeline, we really need to make sure that we're giving room for for women to think with other women, um, whether they are very young women in kindergarten or um, women that are approaching college age. And, and I think it really goes for the same. You know, if you if you look at our diversity in STEM as well, um, I think we really need to lift all voices and to be able to say, you know, that problem solving and nurturing and having the ability to have a multitude of voices is really important. And that girls need to see women role models in STEM. And I would say that's my biggest, you know, area of really kind of looking for growth in our society is to be able to have those role models because if you don't see it, you can't be it. I like that. It's a great quote. We got to write that one down. But I will tell you, you don't need to uh, hold back and say anything about women not being problem solvers or better than men. I know my wife <laughs> rules the nest. Yes. Yeah, I mean, same here. Anytime there's a problem, she'll throw out the idea. I'll look at her. I was like, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Smart man. Yeah. That's right. But no, in a real serious sense, I don't, I don't see STEM in my eyes as being based on sex. And I, I hate this one for some reason. There could be a lot of great reasons. We could theorize about this all the time, but STEM is an area that is predominantly males, especially in, in schools right now. And I think that's based on this whole old school tradition mm -hmm. of what jobs are meant for certain people. And I think we're starting to break that mold. And you can kind of see it. I could see it in the high school because I know what our percentages were 10 years ago in STEM. And I know what they are now. And they are getting better. And that's an encouraging thing. I think uh, as teachers, we could do a better job at facilitating and trying to get people involved there. And that's definitely, as someone that claims to be part of the STEM Avenue, I think that's definitely something that I could do better. And I think that's That'd a commonality. Thank you. 
Yeah. 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 Totally. And you know what? Um, I've just taken to being overt now. I don't. Um, I don't have any subtle messaging with my students. I literally go into a kindergarten classroom and know that we need chemists and we need. Um, people who study physics and we need the hard sciences we need computer sciences computer scientists and we need mathematicians and I literally go in and talk to girls and say did you like this unit and they'll say yes Mrs. Corvalin I loved it this is kindergarten and I say then you like physics tell me I like physics and I'll go in and I'll say wow this like computation was really complicated. You're really good at math. And a girl will say to me, nah, I'm just okay. And I say, say it back to me. I'm really good at math. And having those verbal affirmations is really important. It's really important for them to know that it's okay to say, I am good at, I really like, I have a passion for. And if it's a mantra that they have to hear and have to repeat back to you, then that's what we have to do. That's, it is no longer a subtle nudge towards, I think you might do really well in this. It is. You like physics. You should do this for your job. Okay. And to teachers out there, start saying it. Start saying it to, the, to your girls. The boys will hear it. The boys will hear it absolutely. And they'll say, I like physics too. And you say, you do like physics too. That's amazing. You should go into physics. I, I like that because we could also tie that to just math. Right. Do you yep. remember... Oh, I had a math teacher that hated math, therefore I hated math. Absolutely. And I heard that all the time. I really liked math. I I, I loved math. Mm-hmm. And then I met geometry. <laughs> <laughs> Not a geometry brain, but I still really like math. Uh, shapes were tough. Yeah. Yeah. Well I think I mean it's a great it's a great point and I, I hope that and I think that these types of things are having an effect because I have an equal amount, if not more girls in my high level chemistry course yes. than boys and this is a shift for sure um i do still see there's less girls that will say they want to pursue it yes. past high school mm-hmm. which is maybe like an ongoing issue where more of that type of thing needs to happen mm-hmm. um you know on on my level too so it's a great thing to share out with everybody and a super important message another one of the misconceptions we found uh, kind of deals with something that came up before. You mentioned the STEAM aspect of this, which is an extension of STEM that involves art for people that don't know, but it ties into this myth of the fact that there's not room for creativity. We're dealing with science here, and that's just problem solving, and creativity is does not play a role. What do you, what do you think about that one? So I think we have to reshape um, what our definition of creativity is. I think that reframe needs to come, you know, when you think of creativity, many people jump to like, I can draw, I'm a good artist, I can play music. So you may not be able to play music well, but you may be able to produce it really well. And so when you look at that technical aspect of music production, of video production, that all of that is harnessing creativity that, you know, sometimes we just associate with sculpting or painting or, you know, something else that really, you know, while those are creative functions and you may be really good at that and combine that, you know, maybe part of your creativity is blending two, you know, unusual things together to create something amazing. So if we look at so many of the makerspaces that are happening, you know, in, in different areas, when you have a musician and an engineer that are working in the same room, you might say, well, in my line of work I use it this way and somebody else says well in my line of work I use it this way and all of a sudden you're like wait a minute we could come up with something amazing here we could totally do something different because you know when you have two very isolated industries when you look to blend them that's where that creativity can happen and part of it is the open-mindedness and so creativity when you have an open mind and you have an interest in other people, I think that also is part of being creative, is is listening and is learning new aspects of things and then applying it to what your passion is. We talk about it all the time. I, I, you are, Geist I'm talking to, is highly creative. If I asked you to draw a bird right now, would it look like a bird? How, <laughs> as he draws a bird. Yeah, I yep. mean... But that is a... <laughs> Mr. Geist now has a V on his paper. Right, yeah, just... Uh-huh. <laughs> it's an I mean, eagle. 
I know. An in eagle. flight. It's an ego in flight. Uh-huh. Right. But that's what I'm, kind of what we're talking about here is creativity is traditionally seen as can you draw or can you do this? But there's there's so much more to it than that. I even see like being creative, even if you're just solving a math problem, coming up with like a novel mm-hmm. way to do it mm-hmm. is, that's different than someone else is is That creativity. might not match the book. Yeah, God forbid, right? Mm-hmm. Outside of the box thinking. Yep. I, I, I mean, I have a buddy from high school. He would have been probably valid Victorian, but he's mm-hmm. decided with a couple of weeks left to drop out and get his GED mm-hmm. just because he didn't want to be valedictorian. It sounds silly. Then he went to college, got through the first two years, did fine, decided to drop out, went out to California, and he didn't like the way that people made surfboard wax. So he made his own surf- mm-hmm. surfboard wax. It, I don't know anything about surfing. I am one guy that can run through a wall, but when it comes <laughs> to balance and stretching and all that good stuff, no, no sir. So he made this wax that, you know, apparently did something different and it solved a problem. Very creative. Very right. creative. Right. Didn't have anything to do with painting or sculpting. Yeah, so. Yeah. All right. And then the last myth that we found, which I'm actually, I don't know, kind of curious about this one. Um, the fact that STEM excludes the humanities. So, I don't know. Where do we fall with this one? So, I currently am working with my fourth graders and um, I wrote a grant for a artist in residence um, to come in who is a phenomenal award-winning poet. And so we decided that we wanted to craft our class around um, looking at patterns in nature um, and how that's reflected in poetry. And so taking a look at, um, let's just say cycles. So if you look at Think of all the cycles that you can look at, life cycles, day and night cycles, cycles of tides. So all of these things, when we are outside and creating, you can be reflective on science. You can be reflective on technology. You can be a problem solver through poetic thinking. And so when you have that ability to create and stretch your mind, you look at the world differently. And so as... STEM practitioners, that's what we're aiming to do. Look at the world differently. And so when we look to be creative and solve problems, humanities are in there because when you're creating art and you're using your words in a different way, you're looking at natural phenomena that you hadn't looked at that way before. And so all of a sudden epiphanies can come from that because you've stretched your mind to embrace something that's new and different in a way that your mind not might not typically work. That was very impressive because we threw that at her out of the blue. These, yeah. these, <laughs> these uh, myths, we didn't even tell them tell her what they were going to be until she got here. Well, thank you very much. And, and then she just threw that poetic verbiage well, at I, us. Well, I owe yeah. that to my poet, Colby Cedar Smith, who is out there and, and going to be listening, I'm sure. And, you know, it is, she has a novel and verse coming out. And I tell you, it is amazing to work with a poet as a science mm. mind, as a tech mind, as an engineering mind, as a mathematical mind, working as a, with a poet and becoming and practicing that poetry, it gives you a different look at life, at the world. Let's use this as a a segue then to talk some STEM projects because I think it's so cool. One of the best things about it is how it does, you know, link into other subject areas, humanities included, like poetry, even something like, um, you know, I was going to share a project where Mm -hmm. a STEM uh, assignment for students could tie in with something as mundane and unrelated seeming as like a civics and government unit where, I don't know where I heard about this, but there was a, a, a STEM project. I hope it's STEM. You can tell me if it's not. Mm-hmm. But it was about terrapins, which I believe mm-hmm. are turtles. Yep. Is that right? Okay. So terrapins that can only nest along shorelines where they can like visibly see the sand and then there are also wetlands behind the sand, something like that. And I'm probably screwing that up. Sorry if there's any Terrapin experts listening. But <laughs> the design project is for the students to do a basically beach restoration design that limits, uh, you know, gives these Terrapins habitat to nest. So there has to be this qualification of visible sand with wetlands behind it. 
but also is limiting uh, runoff and beach erosion at the same time. So you set up like a little water table for the kids and they get to basically try different beaches and building them where there's little sponges they can put down to represent the wetlands Mm because wetlands absorb water runoff. They can put in sand and soil and giant rocks and just then pour water over it and see what happens and then analyze those results, determine like the best beach design to limit this runoff, still give terrapins habitat. The whole point of this was the end result of the project is they have to write a proposal to the local government about what they think, what the community thinks the best design for this beach should be. So you're tying in that understanding of here's all the science and testing we did. Now we have to understand how the government works to explain it and petition to these people and get the laws passed. So that was just a super roundabout way to say that this ties in and can tie in with so many other different subject areas. Absolutely, because you want to be able to give those kids a voice and you want to back that up with a, you're never going to go to somebody with a problem and say, hey, this needs to be solved without some proposal. And so that's where our STEM thinking comes in with the proposal, but then you need to give that proposal a voice. And so the the stage in which we do that on is through civic engagement. Yep, that's a super important message. And I think, you know, I shared a, with the STEM project that I kind of popped into my head. I don't know, Helen, if you came here today with any of your particular favorite projects that you wanted to share out with people in case there are any STEM teachers listening or even just a science or math teacher that wants to incorporate some of this stuff. Yeah, so a lot of my projects that I try and um, utilize all of the aspects of STEM um, do center around conservation because I think it is such an important role for our kids to, you know, it's a multidisciplinary role in conservation because it's about behavioral change. And, you know, it's also engaging, engaging behavioral change also, you know, you can kind of get people's attention with innovation. And so creating innovative solutions also catches people's eye. And so one of the things that we like to do in fifth grade um, is we have an ocean pollution project where we look at the effects, the human impacts on the environment. And much like you were saying, Nick, as far as the the terrapins go, you know, looking at the plastics in the ocean, um, mostly, you know, when we talk about microplastics, that's its own issue. When we talk about um, the plastic gyres that are in the ocean, that's its own issue. So um, creating models um, in order to figure out how to remove that plastic. So we actually took Ollie's, which is a small robotic remote control robot that just kind of looks like a wheel, like a cylinder wheel. You can have a multitude of different wheels that go on, wheel coverings that go on it to make it go on smooth surfaces, you know, bumpy surfaces. It's kind of like an all-terrain. And um, what we did is we 3D printed, um, actually Greg Hunter in the middle school helped to kind of engineer this as well. So I can't take credit for it, but we 3D printed a collar, so to speak, to put on that, that then kids could build a cardboard shell around it. So the constraint was difficult for kids because the Ollies are a little bit hard to drive. Um, they, you drive them with an iPad and they sometimes do what they want to and sometimes not, which is an amazing application in real life, right? So we are constrained by what has been invented. And sometimes you have to work with a less than perfect product. And so for that to happen, um, and to collect this plastic that we put in a model sized ocean, they have to be able to get as much plastic out of the ocean in a certain time period. Um, and so if you kind of think of like robot wars, type of, um, you know, battle bots um, (laughs) action that kind of goes on as far as removing that plastic from the ocean. Um, The kids are driving around their um, constructed models to see if a push is better, if a pickup is better, if a scoop is better, um, what gets the smaller plastics, what gets the bigger plastics. So it's all of that trial and error and constant redesign. So um, it's, it was, it's a great one um, on many levels. So I will say that I'm digging all this stuff. Uh, one of the bioethics uh, classes that I taught, I started with two and a half minutes of just aerial footage of the Pacific garbage mm-hmm. patch. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, 
you have 25 minutes to come up with a plan. Mm -hmm. I just let them at that. I told them to go. And, and they came up with not only plans to get rid of it, but devices to get rid of it. And it was yep. kind of cool. I wonder, maybe, I, you said your oldest students are juniors this year. So juniors, yeah. All right. So it was before your students uh, reached up here. Mm -hmm. So, But that was a good one. And then I also did a, another project that I really liked. Uh, it was called Three Fishes, Three Streams, One Budget. And what I did is I collected water from three different streams okay. from where I grew up. One, they all had three different uh, substrates in them, which did three different sets mm -hmm. of things. And I gave them the weather patterns from the last six years. I gave them three different fish and the temperatures they could survive, the acidity, all that stuff. Gave them all the information. I said, all right, you have... $500,000 to manage these three streams. Here's how many fishermen you need to support. You have, uh, I'm going to hire one group. Everyone else is getting, not getting the job. So one group will get A's, everyone else will get F. I didn't care about the grades. I mm -hmm. wanted them to feel the pressure. Mm -hmm. Sure. But we got some really clever budget proposals and how that they were going to handle it and and again, that speaks uh, that project speaks to the civic engagement as well, right? So when you're looking at economic constraints, you know, when you deal with conservation, you're never dealing in black and white. Yeah. It's never should we or shouldn't we. It's always how are we going to do it and how are we going to satisfy all of the parties involved? So I think that's a, a, an amazing example of, again, you know, that feeling of STEM, but the application of it in, in real life. Yeah, and it was on a micro scale, mm -hmm. and I wanted them to know that, but I also wanted them to know that, you know, you could think your way through, and as long as it's a justifiable or a solution that is, or a potential solution, there's really not a solid right or a solid wrong answer. Right. All right, so let's, uh, we want to make sure we have time for the Got Tech Hot Seat, which is always my favorite segment. Let's close out this, maybe we could just each go around uh, right now, and I'll start off since I'm bringing this up and just share one because this is an ed tech show, so we always want to feature some technology, whatever that is. Maybe we each share one piece of technology, ed tech, or resource related to all this. And mine, um, which I'll throw out first, is some, a website that we use a lot at the higher grades, sort of more teaching skills related to STEM. It's called Data Nuggets. Um, we have talked about it on the show before. It's, it's a really awesome website where you can go and just get raw data on tons of different topics. And it's great for the kids to see mm -hmm. not only the types of data that are collected, but then how you deal with that and synthesize that as a scientist to eventually draw conclusions from it, recognize problems, start coming up with solutions and support things you're trying to say. Um, so, you know, it'd be really nice if you could gather all this data yourself in class, but, you know, time and other constraints means you can't, and Data Nuggets just makes a lot of that available. So for any science teachers out there, or math teachers, or anybody, check out Data Nuggets. It's a really, really great source. Amazing. Yep. Let's kick it over to you, and then all right. I'll, I'll bring up the the last one here. So mine's a citizen science app. It's called Zooniverse. Um currently embraced by large companies as well. It's not just for schools, not just for kids. It is for any citizen looking to get involved. I was turned on to it because of um, an orangutan um, project that they were doing. Um, again, to kind of tie in with yours, Nick, um, vast amount of data that needs to be distilled down, right? So um, that was a toss to you for chemistry. Thank you. you. Like yeah, that. thank you. Um, <laughs> so vast amount of data that then needs to be um, looked at. And really for me, um, I had just returned from um, Borneo, Malaysia, and um, I was studying orangutans in the rainforest and orangutans make their nest in strangler fig trees. And so what the drone footage they were able to collect in order to figure out if um, because of habitat destruction, they needed to figure out if they wanted to build bridges in order for um, orangs to get from one uninterrupted piece of the rainforest to another. Um, and so what they were looking at is how many um, nests were in the trees. And so all they needed were for people to go through the pictures and click on where the nests were. And that's it. And so that 
ability to help, you could do it on your lunch hour. You could sit and you could be like, oh my God, I love orangutans. There's ones on penguins. There's ones on, you know, any, really anything, frogs. Um, you could pick your, you know, kind of background or where you want to be and help in this data collection of just going through vast amounts and saying, I'll just, you know, identify and you're just clicking a circle on it. And, and you're seeing all different types of scientist research and they just can't go through everything that they collect. So this is a way of helping. So you feel like I can fly to Borneo, but I could certainly visit on my lunch hour while I'm eating my um, rainforest healthy orangutan free salad. That's awesome. It's like crowdsourcing your, your totally. data almost. Totally. Very cool. I'm down with Zooniverse. I'm going to do yeah. it. I'm right now. Memorial. I'm down. Zooniverse. All right, Note guys. to self, Memorial Day plans. <laughs> Zooniverse. Got it. What do you got? All right, so I was going to go through a couple different ones, but now that we're all talking data, I'm going to kind of go full circle on this one. And there's this there's a guy out there that posts on Twitter a graph a week, and usually it has something to do with well, every subject. But he posts the graph, and that's it. And I will put this in the show notes. I don't have it right now. I should because I wouldn't – for AP Bio, every Friday we would tackle a graph. I wouldn't tell them what the graph is saying, but something that I always like to say is that every graph tells a story. So if it's a good graph, if it's a good piece of data, it should be able, you should be able to look at it and tell a story. And part of that story is identifying the problems and problem solving just by looking at the numbers. So I will definitely mm-hmm. throw, I think it's called like graph a week or something like that. Is it Tur- oh, Turner's graph of the week? Yeah, it could be. I just looked yeah. it up. Turner's okay. graph of the week dot com. If it's the one you're talking about, I, I'll uh, definitely He'll confirm. confirm or deny that yeah. uh, at a future sure. time and put it in the show notes. All right, so that's it for our first segment. Stick around where we put Helen on the Got Tech hot seat. Coming up next. You can follow Got Tech outside the podcast at gottech.com dot com or on Twitter at we got tech. All right, so let's get into uh, our final segment here, the Got Tech Hot Seat. It's always my favorite part of the show. If you haven't listened before or heard the Got Tech Hot Seat, we ask our guests some rapid fire questions. Today we have seven. The guest uh, today, Helen, has not seen these questions ahead of time, so we're getting the first thing that pops into her head, which is what makes it so interesting. Oddly enough, Geis is the one that's going to read these rapid fire questions, and if you can't see me, which you can't because it's a podcast, (laughs) <laughs> I am doing uh, air quotes around rapid fire because... What, are you trying to say I can't speak quickly? Right, because they're okay. going to be pretty slow, but he's going <laughs> to at least do it as fast as he can. And uh, Helen's going to answer them, and then I get to pick which ones I think are most interesting to get more information about. So, do you right. understand the rules, <clears throat> Helen? Yes, All right. I think I'm ready to go. Guys? I okay. just want to say that... You're the reason why people can't speed up this podcast four (laughs) times and be okay with it. (laughs) Fair enough. All right, I'm ready to read. So here we go. What is your most memorable education experience? Living in the Biosphere 2 in Arizona. Name a teacher or educator that impacted you the most. My mom, Nani Stalin. Shout out to mommy. Yep. Shout it out. What are three ed tech tools, apps, or programs that you use in everyday life? Oh, Twitter for record keeping. Ugh, I have to say Google Suite. I know that's boring, but really can't live without it. And iNaturalist. Uh, what is your favorite quote? <sighs> My favorite quote would have to be from Rachel Carson. There is something instinctively healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after the winter. Poetic. Very nice. Yeah. What is your best kept secret? Oh, if it was a best kept secret, could uh, I tell it? playing that card? Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> what is a best practice or a teaching skill that you use in your classroom? Oh, inquiry-based science. You need to let those friends figure out what is happening before you give them the vocabulary. <laughs> what is something that you do to relax and unwind? Travel and read. All right. So there's, I mean, obviously like 10 things there probably we could talk about. We should have done this as like a two-part episode, honestly, because there's, <laughs> there's so much to get into. 
You mentioned the orangutan thing earlier, which I'm not going to ask about because we don't have time to get to that can of worms. But I will ask about, you said your most memorable experiences living in a, was it a biosphere, biozone? What was this? So biosphere two is um, out in Oracle, Arizona. When I lived there, uh, Columbia University Earth Laboratory was in charge of it. I studied there for a summer. I would have studied longer, but um, it was a self-contained experiment in the early 90s, which the two of you might remember that there was a Pauly Shore movie. Yeah. I knew you were going there. <laughs> so it was based, um, that movie was based off of this particular experiment to see if we could live on Mars. And so what happened to the Biospherians that went in, there was a very rich philanthropist and the Biospherians that went in there um, got very sick from um, actually carbon dioxide levels that were being um, absorbed and put back out into the self-contained system from the cement. And they did not know that the concrete would emit and absorb carbon dioxide in the way that they did. And so they had to terminate the experiment for living on Mars, but then they kind of turned it into a, a giant um, greenhouse. It had a full ocean in it. And um, so I actually studied mangrove trees there. And that is when I found out that I was not built for research <laughs> because research does not require a lot of chit chat. <laughs> and so the chit chat was real important in my life. And I decided I was not quiet enough for that. So what you were saying is that you could not befriend a mangrove tree. I tried, but the, you know, it was a one-sided conversation. See, Salty, my best friend for the first uh, 14 years of my life was an apple tree. Well, I named you know, him George. You know, true. Maybe that says a lot of things about you, yeah, Mr. There you Guys. Go. <laughs> Man, that's super cool. And the whole reason I asked was hoping that it had something to do with Pauly Shore. I know, field. I know. So you can't resist. I'm pretty happy. Okay, you. We asked three ed tech tools that you can't or that you use in everyday life, and one of them was iNaturalist. Could you elaborate and tell people about that? Ooh, love iNaturalist. So um, this is a great tool to have out in the field. It is where I think um, conservation and tech catch each other and are really beneficial. There is a lot of research actually that says that children don't need to um, call out the name and, and know the name of the species that they are looking at. But inherently as humans, we are programmed to say, wow, that's a beautiful tree. I wonder what it is. Let's look up the name of it. Do kids actually need that? No. So for teachers out there listening, um, if you're not using iNaturalist, it's totally fine because that's actually not tip top. However, as adults, when we go out and we are hiking and loving being on the trail, um, sometimes you find a really cool bug and it lands on you and then you find out that it's this modern lanternfly nymph and that dun, Dawn dun, Power dun. Spray. <laughs> Dawn Power Spray. Oh, to take them out once you find out what it is? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yep. So um, that's a really handy thing to have in your pocket, a handy tool to know if you're looking at poison ivy or, you know, some amazing orchid. Awesome. So I got to tell the yeah, go ahead. spotted lanternfly story. Yeah, do it. So last year, spotted lanternfly landed on my son's arm, and he totally freaked out. I was like, that's a cool bug. And he goes, what is that? I was like, it's a spotted lanternfly. He goes... It's really pretty. I go, it is the devil in disguise. It is. And uh, he was like, well, what do we got to do about it? I go, well, we have to get rid of it. And he goes, well, how do we do that? So he went the whole summer. Basically, his life's mission for last summer was to see how many he could he wipe could out. Mm -hmm. And my uh, mother-in-law got some Dawn power spray and saw him. You know, she sprayed yeah. one. Saw what it did to him. And the rest of the summer, he has double-fisted Dawn Power Spray <laughs> bottles. I mean, if I knew it was that easy to get him to clean, I would have just, like, made all our countertops yep. like lantern flies. That's right. And we're good. That is right. He made a wee video video infomercial about it. We had some fun. We did. We used the green screen for that. Yep, I remember. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, that was our, our spot and lantern fly experience last summer. It was uh, both tragic and dramatic and yeah. awesome all at the same time. Yeah. All right. And then lastly, you mentioned the best practice or teaching skill as uh, inquiry-based learning, which I, we used to talk about it a lot. We've kind of gotten away from mentioning mm -hmm. specific strategies. Do you want to just give anyone or give people 
a quick rundown of, I don't know if what it is is necessary, but maybe start there and why you like it so much, I guess. Awesome. So I think it just puts inquiry-based science um, really puts kids in the driver's seat and it makes them own their learning. We have stopped talking about it. Um, you know, it's not as frequent as when I graduated college many eons ago. And, um, you know, I think that we can't forget about it. We can't forget about putting, you know, kids in the field and being able to be exposed and ask questions and drive their learning. And so when you start with, you know, here's what we're learning and here's the definitions and, you know, kind of putting that up on, on the board, you know, the, the stickiness that it has just really kind of deflates um, and becomes, you know, a rote, rote learning and, and sets kids up for that that trajectory. When we ask them to experience it first and to really kind of probe through what what's happening and, and looking at phenomenon and and um, kind of driving their own inquiry bus, then um, they really kind of take to that. And, and you know, that creativity is open and, and it might not be the way you would put it to them, but it's the way their brains need it. I love it. It's a, a great way to say and a great way to I think wrap it up. Did we miss anything, guys, or do you feel good? Oh, I feel great about this episode. I thoroughly enjoyed this. This is definitely uh, something that pulls on the heartstrings a lot, and I'm very passionate about So I thank you for being here. Good we'd, stuff. We'd, we'd love, well, I love this. Uh, I'm pretty sure Nick loved it, too. Yeah, great topic. So th- thank you, Helen, for... Well, thank you, guys, so much for having me. This is so excited to be featured on a on a great podcast i have been interviewed on several podcasts before but uh this is going up there in in my top five yeah thank us too this was an <laughs> awesome one so thank you and thank you everybody who's listening for uh listening to another episode of got tech the podcast and spending time with us today we would like to encourage everyone listening to check out helen on twitter at dr hydrogen hc did i get that correct you sure did because hydrogen is the party girl of science gets (laughs) things started there you go dr hydrogen hc and then if you're a fan of us of course as always you can subscribe to got tech the podcast Uh, on any major podcast player, Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, YouTube, and the rest. You can also write us a Apple review, which is the best thing you can do for us besides just telling your friends and colleagues about Got Tech, the podcast, and gottech.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Got Tech, the podcast. Remember to subscribe to our show and follow us at We Got Tech on Twitter so you can stay up to date with the latest episode releases, blog posts, product reviews, and PD announcements. You can also follow Geist and I individually at Geist Got Tech and at Nick Got Tech on Twitter or on Instagram at Nick Got Tech. Finally, remember to check out our website, gottech.com, where we post all our episodes, articles, and resources available to you for free. Until next time.